Welcome, welcome in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We come today in a very poignant uh, remembrance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross, whereby he shed his blood for the remission of sins, not the possibility of remission, but remission of sins. All that come to him in faith, acknowledging who he is, God in the flesh. Knowing that his life perfectly lived, perfectly observed the law. There was no sin in him, no sin found in him. And yet he died in the place of all those who will call him Lord, who will be drawn by the Father to eternal life. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this day through the shed blood of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, we come with that deep sense of gratitude for Lord, we could never work our way into heaven. We could never earn our way into heaven. One sin on our account would exclude us from sharing eternity with you in peace and in fellowship. And we acknowledge today that through the events of Calvary, the events of our Lord taking upon himself the sins of his people, accounted on his account, bearing the wrath of God against all ungodliness. Lord, we are grateful that you have drawn us into the realisation you have shown us the Son, your Son, your only begotten. You have granted us faith in his work, in his merit, in his person. And today, Lord, we wish to be reminded of the events. We wish to be reminded of the cost of our salvation freely given by your loving kindness your mercy your grace undeserved unmerited that we have life in Christ Jesus Lord lead us pour out your spirit upon your people pour out your spirit O God that we may see Jesus this day. To the glory of Christ we ask and for the upbuilding of his people, the church. Amen. Amen. Today is going to be slightly different to a normal service. There's quite a bit of reading from the scriptures. If you'd like to turn to Matthew 27... And we shall read together this chapter, Matthew 27. While you're turning, we thought last night about the events that led up to this point. Jesus has celebrated and instituted the Last Supper with his disciples he has gone to Gethsemane, where the reality of this, what is to follow, is heavily impressed upon who he is, his humanity. We see him nearly crushed by the weight of being the sin bearer of the world. We've seen Judas come, betraying his master. With his words, he says, Master. With his lips, he kisses him. And in that kiss, and in those words, a betrayal. 
Now Jesus has been taken before the Sanhedrin. They have falsely accused him. And now they take him before Pilate. Matthew 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful. It is not lawful for, to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. That then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet saying. And they took the thirty pieces of silver the price of him that was valued. Whom they of the children of Israel did value. And gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and the elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word. Insomuch that the governor marvelled greatly. Now at the feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together Pilate said unto them. Who will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas! Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, He took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. (coughs) Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him. And took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him. And put his own raiment on him. And led him away to crucify him. And 
And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to stay, a place of a skull, they gave him a vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him, with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lamak sabachthani. This is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them stood there when they heard that, said, this man calls for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion, and they that were with him watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. Among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate. And begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. And laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that this deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so that the last error shall be worse than the first. 
Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and they made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. There lies the cold, dead body of the crucified Messiah. There lies Jesus. Let us turn to our hymn books with those thoughts upon our mind and sing together 235. Give me a sight, O Saviour. Was it the nails, O Saviour, that bound you to the tree? Was it those objects of metal through his hands and his feet that secured him to the cross? Do you not know that I can call down 12 legions, more than 12 legions of angels? Nay, it was his everlasting love. The nails didn't hold him. How we would have wanted to have proven all of those mockers wrong. He says he's the Christ. He says he's the son of God. Come down and we'll believe you. And with a word to his father. He could have come down. And the salvation of humanity would be undone. Not one person would end up in heaven. No amount of time suffering can prepare us for God's heaven because it is Christ's blood that purifies us. To think what a lovely day it is. And many will think of today as a day off of work. A day to be with the family. A day to celebrate. But without the understanding of what today actually is about. Today we come together on this solemn day to remember the cost of our salvation and the love of God. Solemn because of what we are considering. The agonising death of the saviour of the world. The giver of our life who died so that we may know true life. As he gave his life, the shedding of his blood for the remission from the death sentence that our own sins would have brought us. Christ was born to die in order that all those who trust in his person, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection might have life. The cross was not our triune God's plan B. It was not some afterthought after the fall of Adam and Eve. It wasn't God being taken by surprise by the events that unfolded before him. As Acts 2 tells us, it was God's predetermined plan. It was God's predetermined will that Christ should go to the cross. Jesus came into this world knowing what his mission was. And that was nothing short of the salvation of his people. The crucifixion of Christ was ordained before the foundation of the world. How many times do we read in the New Testament the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world? This was the intent. This was what Christ came into the world to do. Before mankind had been created from the dust of the ground, 
the shadow of the cross loomed. It loomed in idyllic Eden, where there was no sin before the fall. And it loomed east of Eden. It loomed over Noah and the patriarchs, over Israel. Closer and closer, bigger and bigger did that shadow loom until the promise of Genesis 3.15 was to be fulfilled. That promise given when our first father's father fell, deliberately committed sin, chose, I know better than you God, I will go my way God. And that promise that there would be one who would come and reverse the curse of sin. The one who would trample Satan and be bruised in the process. As Paul writes in Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem To buy back, to purchase them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. At the appointed time, Christ came to make a family. The cross was at God's appointed time, and Christ came in full acceptance of that mission. To redeem his people. He could have slipped away couldn't he? At any point in his life. Before he even the age of 30. Before that he could have just slipped away into obscurity. But he set his eyes resolutely to Jerusalem. Knowing what was to befall him. Christ knew God's plan. The plan that he. Jesus would come into this world to live, to teach, to suffer and to offer up his life in death upon the cross. Christ knew that he was coming into this world to fulfil the plan of the triune God to redeem a people. He was included in the Inauguration, the bringing together of that plan. It wasn't God the Father uh, telling his son what to do. They're co-equal. They're God. To redeem a people. To fulfil the Old Testament patterns. To fulfil prophecies. And to fulfil promises. Christ's death on the cross fulfilled the patterns that were set in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The blood of the animals that were sacrificed upon the altars could never take away the sins of the people. As the constant repetition of those sacrifices proved, Again and again, animal after animal, thousands, millions of occurrences. They needed to be offered up day after day, year after year, repetition after repetition. This showed that it was insufficient, that it could never atone, that it could never cover over the sins of the people. The God of the scriptures isn't a God that sweeps your sin under the carpet and pretends that it hasn't happened or that it didn't happen. Sin, God says, needs to be accounted for. Imagine a book of your life, you know, a counting book. And tally up all of the sins, even the minor ones, 
Even the m most minute of sin that you can imagine is enough to condemn you before a God who is totally holy. One sin will exclude you from heaven and there is not one of us sitting here today or standing here today that has not sinned far more than once. But the sacrifices of the Old Testament were only a shadow. They were a signpost to the sacrifice that ratified all that had gone before. And Christ's sacrificial death was that one-off, once in time, never to be repeated, sacrifice that needed not to be repeated. How dare we think that we can reenact the sacrifice of Christ. As if he was like one of the lambs of the Old Testament. That his blood cannot avail. It cannot cover the sins of his people. What are you saying about Christ? To think that it needs to be reoffered. His sacrifice was complete and sufficient. Hebrews 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of the things. Can never with those sacrifices. Which they offered year by year continually. Make the comers there too perfect. For then. Would they not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshippers once purged. Should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh, Jesus, into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. Notice that we are sanctified. Present reality. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, those who are disciples of Christ, are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and, o and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstools. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Sanctification, to be made holy, to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to have him as our God. Present reality, remember, back in the text. And here it says that they are perfected forever them that are sanctified. We are perfected in Christ Jesus. There is nothing to add to his work. There is nothing that you can bring to God. Can you imagine your dirty, filthy hands, my dirty, filthy hands, offering the king of the universe anything as if he needs it? Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their heart and into their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Hebrews 10, 1 to 18. Finish. One of the cries from the cross, the last cry from the cross is, it is finished, it is completed. The transaction has been.
been made once for all. Jesus fulfilled the pattern of the Passover. And we don't have time today to, to look into all of that signification. He fulfilled the imagery of the temple. We saw that the curtain, that barrier between God and man, the barrier between ho the holy of holies and the common, the world, was torn down the midst as Jesus gave up the ghost, showing that now there is approach directly into the courtrooms of heaven. There is no barrier anymore. He fulfilled the temple imagery. He fulfills the types that are scattered across the Old Testament. But not only did Christ come into this world to fulfill and to ratify the patterns found in the Old Testament, but he also came to fulfill many of the prophecies regarding his life and his death. And we shall only look at one of these prophecies today. Hundreds of, hundreds of years before his birth, Isaiah told of his sufferings. Isaiah 53, if you wish to turn. In the readings in the synagogues, all of the Old Testament is read except this chapter. This chapter is excluded in the liturgy of the Jewish nation. Ask yourself why. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him as stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put, on, put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession.
for the transgressors. This chapter is not heard in the synagogues. There's a, a video that's going around on YouTube. I think it's from one from Israel where they go out into the streets of Jerusalem and they read this passage. And many of the Jews come up and they're angry. Why are you reading the New Testament to us? We don't want to hear about your Jesus. No, no, no. It's in your scriptures. No, I've never heard it. This is clearly speaking of Jesus. This is New Testament stuff. And then they show them. They open up to Isaiah. And what can they do? They've already acknowledged that this is about Jesus. Let's join together and sing 506. What kind of love is this? 506. What kind of love is this? The love of Isaiah 53. The love of Jesus hanging upon the cross to bear the sins to bear the iniquities of his people what kind of love is this Christ did not just come to fulfill patterns and prophecies but he also came to give us hope hope in the promises of God without Christ there is no hope None. No lasting, no eternal hope. But only the fearful expectation of judgment. Either Christ has your sin or you still bear it. There isn't a halfway house. It's not as if Christ did enough just to, to get you over the line, but now you have to make up the shortfall to get yourself to heaven. It's all or nothing. Christ is all to you, or he is nothing. John 3, verse 15 to 17. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have present tense, now, in this life, have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus' first appearance was not for the condemnation of the world. That's for his second coming. Where he will condemn all unrighteousness. All those that have spurned his beautiful death upon the cross. Who think that they can get to heaven by their own merits. By their own works. That's when he comes to judge. This is the promise of God that all those who believe in Jesus Christ have eternal life. Not will have, but have eternal life. Those of you who have God's spirit indwelling in you, who know that Jesus Christ and what he has achieved, have eternal life now. And we wait for that to be perfected and for the fullness of that life to come through. Either at our death or at the return of Christ. But this is the promise of God. He suffered for mankind. For his people. Even the passage in Isaiah it said for many. Not for all but for many. All those who will turn in repentance and in trust and in faith. In his finished work at the cross. All those that call upon his name shall be saved, as we're told in Romans. He suffered for mankind in the place of man upon that cross. He, gives, he grants pardon 
Hebrews 9.12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Having obtained. Has it. He's obtained it. He's grasped it. He has it in his hands. It's not there just as an offer or as a, a, a wishy-washy hope. But it is obtained for his people. Titus 2.14. Who gave himself, Jesus, who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar, a special people. Zealous of good works. He cleanses us from all our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us. Him who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Are you starting to fit the picture together, the, the puzzle pieces together? What happened at that cross? It wasn't a mere potentiality. But he secured the salvation of all those who will bow their knee to him. That will call him master. And will kiss him. But not like Judas. Christ took our punishment upon the cross. This is the message of the New Testament. By birth. We are born in sin. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of this sin, the wages of those sins, as Romans 6 goes on to tell us, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ezekiel 18, 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, is God's declaration. Without exception. But Christ took that account book of all of the sins of his people and they were nailed to the cross they were covered they were paid for by his blood the debt that was once over your life your name was nailed to the cross Galatians says you bear that no more Christ took the hell that we deserved on that cross. And now he commands, doesn't woo, doesn't say, oh please come and follow me. But this is the command of God himself. He commands every person to repent. This is the duty of man. This isn't meritorious. This is duty. To turn from your self-autonomy, your self-rule, and to bow the knee to Jesus Christ, that he is your God. He is your saviour. He is your master. Acts 17, 30 to 31. And the times of ignorance, God winked at. But now, after the cross, after you've heard the message of what Christ has done, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. That's scary. Not a judge that can be bribed. Not a judge that is corrupt. 
but is holy and righteous. He will not dust your sin under the carpet. Your good works, regardless of how many they are, cannot cover over the sins of your life. He is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. It is a guaranteed fact. I know that we're stepping over into Sunday here and the resurrection. But the resurrection proves that God is serious about sin. We are commanded to repent and to come to him to find rest. Matthew 11. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. No longer do you need to work for your salvation, because it is a free gift of God. That workload taken off of your backs. You're freed to live. Live in accordance with God's laws that are now written in your heart unto good works. But not for your salvation. How many Muslims do you speak to and, and they're always concerned? Have I done enough? Are my good works enough to get me into heaven, to paradise? It wouldn't matter if they did more good works than any. If they reject Jesus Christ, which they do, they're going to hell. How many within the Christian religious community think that they can pile on good works and somehow that will gain them merit? To get into heaven. Deluded. Working themselves to the bony. What we would consider good works. And yet those very good works will send them to hell. Because they have rejected Christ. Rejected his finished work. And rather than coming to him. And finding rest for their souls. They work. And they work. He cleanses and he forgives our sins. 1 John 1. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins. Where is that confession to be made? Yeah I know Peter talks about confessing our sins one to another. But where is that confession to be made? It's before the throne of God. To acknowledge that we are sinners. We deserve his judgment. Just as that thief on the cross. That malefactor said. You've done nothing wrong. Remember me. We deserve what we're getting, but you, you're innocent. Remember me when you enter into your paradise. This day, you shall be with me. How many good works did he bring with him? Not spend a bit of time suffering for all of the wrong that you've done, and then you'll be with me, but this day, You shall be with me. That is the salvation that Jesus Christ has given to his people. Christ's death was not that of a martyr. His life was freely given through love and compassion. What kind of love is this? Christ's death was not an accident, nor was it only a potential salvation. Christ's sacrifice upon the cross actually saves 
actually assures us today that there is forgiveness of sin and a certain hope of eternal life with God today. All the sufferings of Christ are of no value to us unless we acknowledge and we accept him. Unless God opens our hearts to acknowledge our desperate need of him as our only saviour. He died to save his people and promises that he will not reject any that come to him in faith and call upon his name. His blood has the power to forgive any and every sin that we may have committed. Wiped clean. Declared holy before God. Declared saints. And this is the promise of God that assures us. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I am come down from heaven not to do mine own will. But the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me. That of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing. But should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me. That every one which seeth the Son. And believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will rise him up at that last day. The shadow that was there on the first ray of light to hit our newly created world. That shadow that looms back over the whole of the Old Testament. That shadow that looms forward over the whole of the New Testament still casts its shadow today. But what is that shadow of the cross to you? What kind of man was that? Who died in agony. That I, the guilty one, might go free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Christ came to fulfil the pattern and the types of the Old Testament. He came to fulfil the the prophecies of the Old Testament. And he came to fulfill the promises of God that he is calling a people to himself and that you can have eternal life now. Today truly is Good Friday to us who have experienced the work of God's Spirit who know what it means to have peace with God and the forgiveness of sin because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice at Calvary. Let us finish and sing together 263. Think, I pray that the Holy Spirit enables you to think about the words that you are singing and ask yourself, Have you truly seen and surveyed the cross of Christ? Now to him that loved us, gave us every pledge that love could give, who freely shed his blood to save us, who gave his life that we might live, be the kingdom and dominion and the glory evermore. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ The love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.